Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to a new week of study. And we're going to continue uh, studying uh, Daniel chapter 11 in connection. Well, we're going to study Revelation 17. We're going to go over some things. But we're looking at Daniel chapter 11. Uh, actually, 10, 11, and 12, Daniel's last vision. Uh, but before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are grateful once again uh, to come together to open your word and to invite your Holy Spirit into our hearts and into this study. We know, Lord, that um, as we have continued to follow line upon line, um, that we have seen things that we did not expect, that we've been corrected in many of our misconceptions regarding these prophecies, and we just ask that you can continue to lead and guide, help us to follow where you lead, and to understand these truths for our time. Be with each person who is studying these things on the internet, and may you bless your word, and may it not, re re not return to you void. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, um, we've... We've spent a lot of time going through uh, Revelation 12, 13, and 17. And we'll look at Revelation 17 again. Just kind of review what we had, had done last week or the last two weeks um, in connection with those uh, visions of John's. But um, we know that what we have been studying has been uh, Daniel chapter 11, verse 2. And... That has been the main uh, point of this this study is that we were directed to do this by Colin. He wanted us to look at Daniel chapter 11 at his study, which was presented on December 25th, 2021. And in, in addressing uh, Colin's study, there was this connection between Daniel 11, the first few verses, and Daniel chapter 3 that is the golden image, and also with the riddle of Revelation 17. And the idea that he had there is that he's going to take these kings of Persia and he's going to line them up with the presidents of the United States. Now, if we look at this, these two verses, also in the first year of Darius the Mede, I even stood to confirm and strengthen him. This is not when the vision occurs. The vision is going to occur as we see in chapter 10, in what is called the third year of Cyrus. Now, we know that that's the first year of Cyrus after uh, Darius the Mede has uh, died. It's the third year from the fall of Babylon. And we know that from a number of different things. But one is in Daniel chapter 1, verse 21. It says, and Daniel continued even unto the first year of the king of Cyrus. So obviously in chapter 10, this year that is called the third year would be what is called the first year in chapter two. And that is Cyrus is, uh, he's, he's the king of Persia long before uh, Babylon falls. He's the general in the year that Darius um is mentioned for the fall of Babylon, Darius the Mede. And then within about two years from the fall of Babylon, Cyrus comes to the throne. And so here, Daniel is simply calling this the third year, the third year since the fall of Babylon, because Cyrus does become the king of lands um, when Babylon falls. So he has a new title. So Cyrus has different counts. You can talk about the third year of Cyrus, which is going to be like, you know, whatever it is, um, I can't remember how long he had reigned before Babylon fell, but it's going to be some 10 years or so before Babylon falls. So Cyrus is already the king of Persia, already a king. He's going to become the king of lands when Babylon falls. And so that would be the third year of him being the king of lands. He's also going to become the king of all of Persia, which is what is being referred to in Daniel 1 verse 21, so the first year of Cyrus. So uh, the point is, when we look at this, this, this vision, it's starting at 
a period of time that we would mark as the time of the end. That is, it has two different kings, Darius the Mede and Cyrus the Persian. Babylon's going to fall, and then within about two years, Darius dies, and Dan, um, uh, Cyrus becomes the king of all of Persia. So it now becomes the Persian Empire rather than the Media Persian Empire. Now, still, the Medes are part of it, but they only have one king now instead of two. Then from then it says, now I will show thee the truth. There shall stand up yet three kings in Persia. So we know that we're going to have um, Cabeses, uh, False Myrtus, and then Darius the Persian or Darius the Great, Darius Hystaspes, right? And then a fourth shall be far richer than they all. And that's going to be Xerxes. And by his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Grisha, which is what Xerxes does in Ezra chapter one. It's discussing his plans to go against Greece. And then it's going to move to Alexander the Great. Because Grisha is ne mentioned next. And then it says a mighty king shall stand up. That's the king of Grisha. That's Alexander. And then he's going to be broken in verse four, and his kingdom's going to be divided towards the four winds of heaven, not to his posterity, uh, nor according to the dominion which he ruled, for his kingdom shall be plucked up even for others besides those. So, so we're going to see that his generals are going to divide Greece in, in various ways at first. It ends up being basically four, and then, then two, and then finally eventually one when it's conquered by by Rome. So that, that kingdom uh, becomes absorbed by Rome. But the king of the north is ultimately going to destroy the king of the south, um, and that's going to be Paneum, right? So, and then connected with that is going to be this whole history of Rome coming in and taking over. So the point is, it's divided towards the four winds of heaven, Right. It's not divided towards four generals. It's just divided completely. But they do basically break into four parts, north, south, east, and west. And the north is going to be the, the Seleucid Empire. And the south is going to be the Ptolemaic Empire. And then it's going to show in Daniel chapter 11 these various battles, what's going to happen in the future from Daniel's perspective. Now, our focus so far has been upon these kings. So when we, prior to us understanding any of this, um, we had studied the kings of Persia. And the kings of Persia were studied, the first seven kings of Persia, because we had the last seven kings of Judah. That is, in 2013, uh, Jeff is going to go through... Um, a study dealing with the kings of Judah, beginning with Manasseh all the way up to Zedekiah. And there's going to be four events, the four seven times are going to be fulfilled in that history. And so those seven kings from Manasseh to Zedekiah become this model. He connects it to the seven thunders. And so he begins comparing these seven kings with the seven kings of Persia. And as time goes on, we then um, come to understand the kings of Persia. And in Daniel chapter 11, we start to make this prediction regarding Trump as far as Xerxes. Now, we have sort of mixed these together. That is, we have these seven kings of Persia. We have the seven kings of Judah. And we also have the seven presidents of the United States. But initially, Jeff never counted up to seven. Right. He would stop with, because he's using Daniel chapter 11, he would just stop with Xerxes. Now we know following Xerxes is going to be Greece. That is going to be the globalists. Now Colin has tried to say, no, what's mentioned there is Alexander is actually Trump again, right? Now I knew that that was wrong. How to explain that was wrong back on December 25th, 2021, because it never seen that before. 
I just knew it was wrong. And I had some reasons why I thought it might be wrong. But part of those reasons had to do with these seven kings of Persia, going back to the original study of how we had done this. And so we've taken the time to go through all of that history, everything that we could possibly look at that relates to these things. Now, the big thing that Colin was doing was applying this riddle to the presidents of the United States. But in doing so, he was making a common assumption that we have all made is that the seven kings are the same as the seven heads, which are the seven mountains. And so only recently have we even considered that when it says, and there are seven kings, five are fallen and one is, and the other is not yet come, that this is not referencing the heads at all. That this is referencing the kings who exist at the end of the world in which this beast is, is um, representing. So it's representing modern Rome, what's happening at the end of the world. Now, the woman rides this beast, this scarlet colored beast, and she sits upon seven hills. And that would be a reference to Rome itself because that's the seat of Rome in which she controls the world. And it's true that she controls the world from Rome all through that history of the papacy. But this is talking about, it's referencing us back to the end. Now we know that it's going to bring us to, uh, in verse eight, the beast that thou sawest was and is not. And we just assume that that's the scarlet colored beast. But if we think about it, and in the study that we've shown that this is actually the beast of Revelation 13 that's being referenced. So once we see that, we can see that this is the explanation of this woman who is the papacy riding this scarlet colored beast. In order to understand that, he refers us back to the papal beast, the leopard like beast of Revelation 13, because it's the only beast which could have been is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. That can't be said of the scarlet colored beast. And we looked at the pioneers understanding that this is a form of Roman government and that this is a Republican form um, and that the period that it is not is the papal period. Um, but none of this really made any sense, right? So, or pardon me, the is not is uh, the empirical period. And then it comes back, there's the seventh head and then the eighth, None of this made any sense. It created all kinds of contradictions. So we, we came to the conclusion that the heads are not the same in each of the beasts. And the horns, even though they have some similarities, are not the same things. Now, the horns of Revelation 12, we take to be um, the ten emperors, not the 10 kingdoms that come in and cause the fall of Rome because they're part of pagan Rome. Now, we could be wrong about that. Maybe there's some way in which we could address those as being uh, the 10 pagan kingdoms, but definitely in Re Revelation 13, they are the kingdoms of Europe as they come out of those, uh, those nations that conquer Rome. Now, we know there isn't um, 10 tribes that conquer Rome, but there is 10 kingdoms that result, according to A.T. Jones. And that's going to be in 476, that you're going to have these 10 nations. And these are going to lead to, ultimately, Rome is going to pluck up three of those. But still, 10 becomes that symbol during that, that period of time. And we're saying the 10 horns in our time represent the whole world as represented by the United Nations. So we have the heads and the horns. So the heads are different things in different beasts, and the horns are different things in different beasts. But if we recognize that then, when it says there are seven kings, this would have been in that um, the other beasts. So there are, we have the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. So the dragon power is going to be represented by these ten horns. Um, but the seven kings are part of apostate Protestantism. 
They're the false prophet. That's where the seven kings are. And so we still have to prove some of these things. That is, we still have to discuss them and look at them. Um, but what we would say is that we have had these seven uh, Persian kings, and we have had the last seven kings of Judah, so the first seven kings of Persia, last seven kings of Judah. And we've looked at other ones. But the question is, if there are seven kings, that this is not related to, if it's not related to the heads, we can see is it, it is modeled after first the last seven kings of Judah. It also would be modeled after the seven kings of Rome and also the first seven kings of Persia. And that these seven kings then, how we, we got that is in God's providence. So now we're going to agree with Colin that these seven kings represent the presidents of the United States. But we're not going to necessarily, we have to examine how we are going to number these seven kings. Are we going to start, as Colin does, with Reagan as the first? Or are we going to line them up uh, the way that we had when we looked at the seven kings of Persia with, um, so which would mean we would have to put George Bush as the first, or is there other ways in which we could understand these seven kings? And then we have to understand if five are fallen and one is, when is is, right? And the other is not yet come, and when he cometh, he must continue a short space. Now, we can see that the beast that was and is not even he is the eighth. That's pretty clear. The beast that was and is not is the papal beast of Revelation 13. He was. 1798, he is not. But he is the eighth. And he will, and it says he is of the seven. Now, when we look at the Greek, that is not, it doesn't say that he is one of the seven, but that he comes from the seven. Now, if we can see that there was a, a league made with the, uh, the papacy by the United States, by Reagan, we can see that, and we know that these kings, these last seven kings, are connected to this league, that in some way we can, we can say that whatever happens, because we know it's going to be this uh, two-horned beast of Revelation 13 that's going to create an image to the beast and cause all the world to worship the beast and his image, then we can see how the eighth is going to be the result of, that is, it's going to be of the seven, of these kings at the end of the world that we call the presidents of the United States. Now, that's a long explanation. Any thoughts on any of that? Yeah, what comes to me is is where it says in the spirit of spirit of prophecy, this child of the papacy, referring to you know, Sunday. Mm -hmm. So the law regarding Sunday, and I'm thinking, okay, you have the U.S. marrying the papacy, and they produce the Sunday law, the child of the papacy. Yes. So so we can see how it says the eight is of the seven. That is, it's of these seven. So if we look at it this way. We have the beast, that's the papacy, that's the beast of Revelation 13, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, right? So the beast is the beast of Revelation 13, the beast that was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. That's the papacy. And it's also the eighth, okay? So it's, now we have the ten horns. The ten horns is the UN, that's the world, right? The papacy has controlled the world through its civil power in Rome, right? But it is a religious power. It's a woman. But it's acting as a civil power in order to exercise its power. 
but it doesn't have power until the UN gives its its power. Now it's going to the ten horns are going to receive power one hour with the beast, with this woman, with the papacy. But in this, we have to say, well, where is the United States? If the seven heads are are these seven kingdoms, that doesn't really fit. It just makes the United States one of those heads. But if the seven kings are representing um, one of those those um, heads of the beast of Revelation 13, right? The one when the beast is not. We can see how Revelation 13, the second part, dealing with the two horned beast that rises in 1798, must be the power that has the seven kings. That is, the seven kings would not be popes. They can't be um, the progressive kingdoms. Right. They can't be Babylon. Right. So the seven kings must be the presidents of the United States at the end of the world, at the time of the end. And so we have to figure out how to count those out. Now, um, so I'm going to do it, I guess, this way. I'm going to just draw a diagram like this. Um, like that um, okay so I'm just gonna um, uh, expand this period of the seven kings just uh, so we have this as a as a drawing okay so we're going to take this we're going to expand this out like that and so we have this other line that we're going to draw so we're going to have these seven presidents Um, I'll do it this way. Okay. So we're going to have a new line here of these seven kings. So we're just going to place them in here. Um, now, how we number these kings is part of the uh, part of the difficulty, right? So we we're not really sure how to number these kings at this point, and. So we know we're going to have. Um, Oops. Now, we have talked about numbering the first king as Reagan. Now, why would we number the first king as Reagan? He brought down the USSR with the help of Pope John Paul II. Okay, and he's going to make a league, right? So that would right. be the main reason is this league that he makes, okay? And um, now why is that important as far as a numbering him? So right. well, I'm thinking that all, all the so-called U.S. kings since then have made league, leagues with the papacy. But I did see when Trump went to visit the Pope, that uh, was a few years ago, and that Pope was furious at the end of that meeting, and there was no buddy-buddy handshaking and hugs and all that stuff. 
So I think my theory is that at that time, uh, Francis wanted to impose, like, let's do a Sunday law, you know, for the U.S. and Trump declined. That's my theory. Can't be proven. Yeah, it, it, yeah. it definitely is possible, right? So we don't know the whole story of what's happening always behind the scenes. But one thing is we know that uh, uh, Xerxes typifies Trump and um, Xerxes does not support a Sunday law, right? So that's one of the things we learned studying Esther. Um, now, so we're going to have, of course, here we're going to have eight way marks. <coughs> Oops, I don't know why I typed an eight there. I guess because I was saying eight. Okay, so we have these. And so we have all these, these different way marks. And we have to decide how we're going to number them. Um, like how we're going to name them or label them. So we got uh, so if Reagan was the first one this would be Reagan uh, Bush the first Clinton Bush the second Obama Trump Biden Right. If we're just going to do sort of how Colin was doing it and then he was going to have the eighth to be um, Trump again. But we know that the eighth is not one of the seven, but he comes from the seven. That is the United States. This two horned beast is going to speak as a dragon and that it's going to create an image to the beast. And so the eighth, it tells us plainly is the beast that was and is not, right? So that means these seven kings are seven presidents of the United States, but there's going to be an eighth. But that eighth is not a president of the United States, right? He's just going to follow after the seventh president. Now, one of the problems we would have, if we say that these are actual presidents, and then we just say, well, Biden is the seventh. We have to say that Biden represents something more than just, or the seventh here represents something more than just Biden. That it represents the globalists, right? That the globalists have taken over the United States. Now, when the globalists are conquered, then the papacy will uh, come in. So. That's one way of looking at it. Now, we could say, well, the eighth has to be one of the presidents of the United States. But if the eighth is the beast that was and is not, I don't see how the eighth can be Trump. Right? Because it tells us what the eighth is. It uses the symbol of the papacy. Now, we know that Colin is, is doing something different. That is, he's, he's taking the, the, the traditional interpretation that we have. And he's simply making an application of the riddle to the presidents of the United States. He's not interpreting the seven kings in its direct form as the seven presidents. He's only doing it in a secondary form as a parallel, right? So he's going to be have, have uh, the fifth that, that falls in this riddle in these kings initially to be papal Rome, the sixth to be the United States, the seventh to be the UN, and then the eighth to be a pa the papacy again. And so he just simply applies this to the presidents of the United States. But we are saying that based upon how we read this and how we uh, discern the interpretation of, of the angel to, to this vision in, in Revelation 17, how he explains the woman and the scarlet colored beast that she's riding upon, that these seven kings cannot be the seven heads upon which the woman sitteth. Right? And that seems to be the most consistent. It gets rid of all kinds of different uh, contradictions. 
But it means that if we're applying them directly to the presidents of the United States at the end of the world, that that, that seventh one must be different, right? It, it, it can't be just a president. It has to be Biden, but beyond Biden. And and whether that's that's reasonable or not, that's what we have to decide. Now, that's if we start with Reagan as number one. Now, if we start with Bush the first as the first, and we parallel him, parallel him with Cyrus and how we count the seven kings of Persia, well, then we have um, the five are fallen. Uh, Trump is going to be the fifth one, not the sixth. Biden would be the sixth aligning with Artabanus. And then we would have a seventh, which would be what? Some other president? Right? Who would line up with Artaxerxes. And then we would have an eighth. Now, one of the things that we talked about before was that when we looked at the seven kings of Judah, the last seven kings of Judah, and we get to Zedekiah as the seventh king, Babylon is going to conquer um, Jerusalem and remove Zedekiah, kill him. And it then says, I will overturn, overturn, overturn it until he come whose right it is. Now, since Babylon is the power there, it's going to be overturned to Medo-Persia, overturned to Greece, and overturned to Rome. And then Christ is going to come, and he is the true king. He is the eighth king of Judah in that context. So we can see that however we're going to understand these seven kings and the eighth, it is a counterfeit of Christ, right? Does, does that make sense to people? So that is the papacy is counterfeiting Christ. Is that consistent with what we understand? There is. Yes. Okay. It's made a logical point. Okay. Um, so what we still have to understand, what we still have to determine is where we start. Now, there are reasons to start with Reagan, but if we go back to the model, the model is going to start with the first seven kings of Persia and the last seven kings of Judah. And if we're going to line up the first seven kings of, of Persia, we have to start with Cyrus, correct? Yes. Okay. So is there any other way that we can look at this? Now, I guess just to throw a Spaniard in the works or a Spanner in the works is um, to, to suggest one of, the, one of the problems that we have always had is Artabanus. Now, I still like Artabanus there. I think it lines up best when we put him as... Uh, parallel to um, to Biden, right? So, so I like this view better. I don't like to start with Reagan, but but if we have Artabanus in there, I like it. Now, some people suggest that Artabanus is not a king of Persia, that he's just a placeholder there temporarily, which is why I like him for Biden. Biden becomes a placeholder. But he still is marked as the sixth. Now, maybe there's some other way that we haven't thought about it yet. But um, what if Artabanus isn't there? Right? What if we start instead, we count the seven kings of Persia? We, 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 we're not really dealing with the kings of Persia per se, but just the seven kings from the fall of Babylon. Well, then you could say, okay, Darius the Mede is the first one. And that would parallel Reagan. And, and Cyrus is the second one, right? 
And you just don't have Artabanus in there at all, right? You would then have um, Darius the Mede, number one, Cyrus, Cambyses, number three, Falsmyrtus, number four, uh, um, Darius, number fifth, and then you would have, um, did I do this right? I don't think so. Yeah, then Xerxes, number six, and then you would have uh, Artaxerxes, number seven. So it's just kind of weird getting rid of Artabanus. But but we don't have an eighth here, per se, right? So, you know, we're not going to have the eighth king of Persia that somehow fulfills that role. And so I don't, I don't really know how we would deal with these eight symbols if we're going to apply it to the kings of Persia. We could, of course, just count all of them, right, so that the first one is is uh, Darius the Mede, and then you have the eighth one, and you put Artabanus in there, and the eighth one. But then that's eight kings of Persia, right? So each time we look at it to try to make this parallel, we know that the model or the template for the, the seven kings is going to be the last seven kings of Judah. So... I mean, I like I like Artabanus being number six. I like Artaxerxes number seven. So, so these are the kings of Persia. Who's number eight, though? Like, if we're gonna if we're gonna use that model from uh, from the kings of Judah, how how would we address this? We just don't address the eighth when it comes to the king of Persia. I'm going to get these guys' names lined up here, too. I'll just use abbreviations. Darius the Mede. Cyrus. Cambyses, Oops. any thoughts on this? I'm drawing this out. Bosmertus. Rise first. Now here we're just putting all these eight in here. Nobody has any comments on this? Any thoughts? Any questions? Still thinking about it, Colin, Theodore. Yeah, well, can you think out loud? <laughs> Anybody? Any ideas? So, so obviously we got these um, these possibilities. Now, if we did it this way, I mean, the numbers aren't matching the first seven kings of Persia. Right. right? In this one, it's just, um, yeah. So any thoughts on this, Dwight? I'd had to step away for a second, but I've also been going over other points of history in okay. all of this. Okay. One of the things that that I have been considering 
since something I looked at yesterday had a lot to do with how the different kings, whether we're talking Persian, Greek, or Roman, mm -hmm. come down to conquer Egypt. Now, I recognize that Egypt has been considered as the king of the south. Right? Well, dealing with when you're dealing with Greece, yeah. I mean, it's and it's also referred to the south from Israel because they come up from the south, just as Babylon is said to be the king of the north. Right. In, in other sort of illustrations. But in Greece, it is the king of the south, uh, the Ptolemaic Empire. Right. But we there there was a point in history where Cambyses went to conquer Egypt. Yeah. So we can we can point to kings of Persia, kings of Greece, and kings of Rome that okay. that had conquered Egypt. Okay. Now did we ever have a a situation of Babylon going down into Egypt as well? Going into Egypt? Yeah, conquering them. Well, um, I don't know about completely conquering them. Yes, they did, didn't they? they you have a, um, in Isaiah, it talks about them, don't it? Well, they're going to have wars with, with, ba with Babylon and Egypt have wars. Right. I mean, but as far as Babylon conquering Egypt so that it becomes part of the Babylonian Empire, I don't think that occurred. Right. <clears throat> now, we're looking at these, at these situations where we have these, as, as you're pointing out, we're looking at the the time period from 1989 to the Sunday Law being a period of about seven kings. Yes. And as you're lining this out, um, Cyrus, Cambyses, False Myrtus, Darius, Xerxes, and then Artabanus, but then also going after that to Artaxerxes as the eighth. Because here I could just simply do this. I mean, yeah, because that doesn't make sense to me, to be honest. I mean, no, I would, would say this, this makes more sense. I would right? agree. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, to put Darius the Mede as, as one of them, well. It, just, it, doesn't, it doesn't fit. Right, because... Because he's not a king of Persia. Now, it doesn't mean that Darius the Mede doesn't have any part to play. Right? Because he does. He's going to be there at the time of the end. Right? So, so when we deal with comparing these to the presidents of the United States, and we say, well, there was this league made with Rome by Reagan. Well, that still would line him up with Darius the Mede. Right. He's just not going to come apart out of that count of the seven. Right. Now, I've considered it because, you know, because we would say, well, the five are fallen. You know, Xerxes is the one or Trump is the one, you know, that is, you know, five are fallen. One is and one still still yet to come. But here in this, we're going to have these first five kings. And if we want to have some kind of parallel, um, even though we're not saying that, that the seven kings are the seven heads, but there still is some kind of parallel to those heads, right? Well, this, this is... We know also... because the beast that was and is not, it's going to be is not in 1798, right? And then the United States is going to, to be there. And then, you know, so that's going to be the sixth, and then the UN is going to be the seventh. So, so if we have it this way, then the one that is is not Trump, 
as we would have in Collins' list, but Biden. Correct. Right. And so it's so Artabanus would line up with Biden, and and that would be the time in which we are directed. We're directed to the end of the United States. So there's seven kings. Now, those those kings are presidents of the United States, but still at that time, they aren't in control of the globalists until Artabanus. Now we know Xerxes loses to the globalists. That parallels that that history. Um, obviously, Artabanus is going to come later, but still it parallels the idea that he loses to the, to the globalists. And Artabanus, in this case, in the presidents of the United States, is going to be Biden, who aligns with the globalists. And that means that the seventh king is could be a president of the United States in, in this symbol, right? It's not just you know, some abstract thing. It would be the next president is going to be the seventh. Well, the way that yeah, the way, okay, that, go on. The way that you have this presented right now mm -hmm. is better in line with Daniel 10, segueing to Daniel 11, 2, because as as eleven two has read, and as I think you've been pointing out, the the situation that we've got right now is we have this taking place during the rule of Cyrus. Mm -hmm. Daniel is then shown that three kings are going to come up after Cyrus. Mm -hmm. And then the fourth will be richer than they all. Yeah. Now, and then, and then the next thing is, is going to be Greece, which Artabanus or Biden would represent. We know that Greece has been increasing in power at that time. And I'm speaking the historical Greece. Just like we're, we're understanding that Greece is, or the, the globalists are increasing in power right now. Mm-hmm. So the the lineup as as you're pointing out here taking Darius the Mede as the equivalent of Reagan yeah Cyrus then Bush the first. And then Clinton as Cambyses. Yeah. Bush the second is false Smyrtus. Obama as Darius. And then Trump here as Xerxes. Yeah. And then this would be Biden, a placeholder. Right. But then the next president would be the seventh. Correct. Now, one of the things to know about this is that these kings of Persia are, are par paralleling the kings of Judah, right? So we have that idea. Um. Now, in the kings of Judah, you're going to have the eighth being Christ. You're going to have this overturning, 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 leading to Christ. So he is the eighth. So in these seven kings, Bush the first, Clinton, Bush the second, Obama, Trump, Biden, Artaxerxes, 
then the eighth is going to be the papacy, right? So the eighth is uh, the papal power. Now, when we line them up this way, though, we don't end up with an eighth for the kings of Persia that I know of. We've never tried to say, well, who is the eighth in the kings of Persia? Right. I mean, there are other kings of Persia, but we don't we don't have that parallel in the kings of Persia. And of course, we have the other illustration, which is, you know, three shall stand up, there shall be a fourth. But then the next is Greece. Right. Not not Artabanus. But we would have to say whoever the next president is. Um, this president would be the one that would initiate this Sunday law. You know, if this if this model is correct. But then the eighth would have to be the papacy. Right. So if we're going to have an eighth here taking these seven kings. Well, the eighth, he's the beast. So we could just here put simply the beast. That's going to be the eighth. Right. Because if we're, if we're applying the riddle of the seven kings, that has to be the seven kings. Whoever this is, this would just be a question mark. We don't know who that is. But the eighth is the beast. But it's because this is the image to the beast that is being represented by these seven kings. Because we can see that the image to the beast is formed in our history. Now, Reagan parallels Darius the Mede. You know, they're not numbered as one of the seven. But they're still, Reagan is there in making that league with Rome. So what follows are the seven. And so it's it's a little bit different, of course, than what Colin's doing, because he wants Trump to come back into power and be the seventh. Or in this case, I guess he would have Trump be the eighth, right? Which wouldn't make sense. Now, the question is, how do we understand this seventh? Do we just understand it? Because we can see that Biden represents the globalists, but he is a placeholder. So is this is this going to be uh, the conservative response to wokeism, or is this going to be just um, more of the globalists again? We don't know who the next president is going to be at this point. The main thing that we're trying to point out here is that, that this is based upon a model of the seven kings. And we did look at the seven kings, um, you know, as the seven heads. So we have the seven heads over there. And the reason why I have the seven heads, which aren't in this Revelation 17, those are not what we we're saying the seven heads are. Uh, so these are the seven kings. Revelation 12, right? Now, right. They are related to the seven hills. That is, these seven kings establish these various hills. It's not just as direct as that, but they do do developments on these different hills. So the, so the seven kings are connected to these seven hills. That's part of what the seven kings, and, and it could be why in legend they have seven kings, because they have seven hills. I don't know. Uh, but the point is, that's the model here, I think, for the kings in Revelation 
uh, chapter 17, is it's referring back to these first original seven kings of Rome. So just the end is declared from the beginning. So you have seven kings at the end of, you know, pagan Rome or at the beginning of pagan Rome. And you have seven kings at the end of modern Rome. And, and they're going to be these, these presidents of the United States in this context. So it ties lots of different things together. But the seven hills of Rome are the seven heads in Revelation 17. Okay, any other thoughts on this? So I know you had more to say, Dwight, and I kind of cut you off there. No, you're you're fine. I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot really to be to be looked at here because some of what you know what we have all been paying attention with and we've we've all been looking at is we need to have a better understanding of our history in line with what Daniel 11.2 is saying. This fits better than the idea of placing Darius the Mede in the number one position. Yeah, or placing Reagan in the number one position. Well, I'm I'm speaking in the in the lineup that's before us right now. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, definitely it's better. Yeah. So the direction that we take, especially in in what we're trying to work through here with Revelation 17, and comparing this with Daniel 11, mm-hmm. is that Revelation as as being the open book and Daniel 11 being its companion, they need to be able to agree with each other. And this is, is definitely more in agreement than what we have, what we've seen before. Yeah. Yes. And, and then, you know, we have Xerxes stirring up all against the realm of Grisha. And the next thing is going to be Alexander the Great, Greece, right? And we would say, well, Trump stirred up all against the realm of Grisha, the globalists. And with the fall of the United States on January 6, 2021, with Biden, which is where Trump is defeated and Biden then wins, the globalists win. Biden just becomes a placeholder. So he's not Alexander the Great. As no, a king, not. as a king, or anything like that, but it does represent the globalists uh, conquering them. Now we know Xerxes loses not to Alexander the Great, right? He loses to um, just to Greece. Alexander is going to be later. Um. So, so in this context, if we're going to talk about Alexander, uh, you know, we definitely aren't placing him at Biden. Right. We're just saying that. That that's the next kingdom that comes. Is going to be Greece. The three shall stand up the fourth and then it doesn't say, you know, they're going to have another king of Persia. They just go directly to Alexander. So so Biden becomes a placeholder. As as a president. Right. So the question is, you know, do we have another president who then. Uh, because remember, this is this is the undoing of the captivity, the top line here, Cyrus. This is the three decrees that is ending the captivity, reestablishing God's people. In this one, this is a dissolution of the United States, right? Correct. If anything's being set up, any kingdom, it's the kingdom for the beast to rule over, right? Well... We're also in a, we're also in a situation because what what Sister White has pointed out several times in in what she has presented that there would be what would seem to be another civil war, right? Yeah. 
Now, Biden, as a placeholder, is not any different than the president that preceded Lincoln. Okay. He was definitely a placeholder, but he was someone that was ambivalent about the struggle that was going on from 1856 to 1860 in the free and the slave states. Okay. Now, um, now, so when we're dealing with Lincoln, um, I mean, we're going to have lots of presidents of the United States. I mean, the first is going to be what uh, George Washington and John John Quincy Adams or whatever. No, John Washington, Adams. John Adams, and Thomas then Jefferson. Jefferson. Okay. Now you're not going to have like you couldn't just put you know Abraham Lincoln. He's going to be what one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. He's going to be like the 16th president of the United States. Correct. And, um, you know, so he doesn't he doesn't fit in with, you know, just counting from the beginning of the United States. But. Um, you know, maybe there is some way in which um, he fits in with Millerite history. Um, you know, I mean, uh, John Tyler is the president in 1844. And then you're going to have James Knox, Zachary Taylor, Millard Fillmore, Frank Pierce. Right. So, yeah. yeah. So Abraham Lincoln would be the sixth from, if you don't count John Tyler as one, he'd be the seventh if John Tyler is the one. Uh, you know, I'm just saying, I'm just looking at these pre- can we make Abraham Lincoln, uh, you know, the seventh, <laughs> right? That's all I'm looking at. You know, at the beginning of the United States. Well, it's it, it's entirely possible because in in looking at at so many of these things, James Buchanan the president before Lincoln Mm -hmm. was a Democrat. The first Democrat president of the United States was Andrew Jackson, who was the seventh president. Okay. The eighth president, Martin Van Buren, was also a Democrat. We have spoken quite a bit about the first Republican, but in these Lincoln, but in these lines, we've never really taken the time to observe the first through the eighth Democrats. Okay. And the Democrats were the ones that were uphold for they they were the ones that were there for upholding slavery just like mm-hmm. right now most of those within that party are upholding rights of other groups small people as we mm-hmm. would describe them in the bible mm-hmm. So there may be something else that we need to look at. Yeah. And I mean, I mean, right now we're just trying to sort through these things. We're we're trying to find a consistency. Um, So whether we look at, because Jeff did look at the different presidents in different contexts, but here at the end, if, if we're going to say, you know, that there is going to be a seventh president, He's going to parallel Artaxerxes in a mirror fashion. That is, this is the fall of the U.S., not the building up of the U.S. Right. So, 
know, and I would say that the next president, I mean, I've tried to guess based on scripture, you know, what's going to happen. And, and I don't know that I can tell what's going to happen. I mean, I don't know, is there going to be a major right wing backlash in the United States? One thing we can say is there will be a civil war. Brother Theodore. Yeah. Where does the Sunday law fit in all this? Well, that's what we're trying to figure out. So uh, is, is the next president going to bring in a Sunday law, or is it just going to be the president in which the civil war becomes the civil war? You know, you know what I'm saying? Like, not just what we have now, but all-out civil war. And that could be Trump. I mean, Trump could be the president in a, in a time of civil war. But it could also be whoever wins that's not Trump, which could be what causes the civil war. You know, like American politics doesn't make much sense to me. All, all that the media had to do was ignore Trump. All the Democrats had to do was ignore Trump. And he would have gone away, right? Or am I wrong? Has Trump become more popular with all of the opposition that he's received from the media, from the courts, from the Democrats? Has that made him more popular or less? It's made him more popular. Yeah. If they just would have ignored him, he would have gone away. So, and, and I don't know, are they just that stupid that they can't figure this out? Or is it just that they're, they're just so caught up in Trump derangement syndrome that they just have to have this enemy of Trump? If they didn't have the enemy of Trump, would they have a reason to exist? Well, the theoretically, you know, their reason to exist is to have a political party to help run the country and bring about peace and prosperity in the United States and just be sensible leaders, right? But the whole system has devolved into... Um, this adversarial idea, you need this enemy to take the focus up off yourself. But they could have just ignored Trump and he would have gone away. So, so Trump is more popular than ever. I mean, it, it is possible he could win the Republican nomination. It's possible he could even win the election. But whatever happens, I can't see anything other than civil war. And so if Artaxerxes represents the setting up of the civil authority in Jerusalem, because that's what um, Artaxerxes' decree does, right? Then whoever this president is, it would be tearing the tearing down of the civil authority. That is, we would just have to say, whoever the president is, it's going to mark the civil war. Right, so he's a, a civil war president. Right, that's pretty badly spelled. Okay. There we go. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. And also, since Xerxes was killed by one of his own, I think, am I correct? You can expect whoever is going to be elected will also be assassinated. Well, um, yeah, I don't know how Artaxerxes died. Um, but yeah, it's... Whoever whoever is going to be elected, I mean, I just think the United States is heading for a civil war. I mean, you know, a more all-out civil war, you know, a bloody civil war. Yeah, six. <laughs> I'm just warning people: get out of the U.S. like that. Yeah. yeah, and the other thing that we see, I mean, I mean, I'm not, 
a believer that what's happening in Israel is, you know, we look, need to look at the prophecies of the Bible to, to find out, you know, where that fits in with prophecy as the evangelicals do. But we can say that the civil unrest in Israel definitely can be a catalyst for what's happening in the United States. And, and the confusion that people have over, you know, who are we supposed to cheer on? Um, uh, creates a, a real division within even within uh, the left, right? Because you have some of the left, you know, who definitely uh, is for uh, Hamas, but you have some of the less left that, that is their Jews, right? And, um, you know, Hollywood, in spite of all of the, you know, the wokeism, is still primarily a, a Jewish uh, institution, right? So, so there's there's just a lot of confusion going on right now at the present time. So, so who is ever the next president? We we can say that it's if this if this scenario if this line of reasoning is correct if we're going to apply this because remember now we're not just applying this in in the sense in our line we're taking revelation 17 and doing a direct application of it to the last seven presidents of the united states now sure it's connected to our line because we have a time of the end there but that time of the end is is not just a repeat of history it's actually a direct prophecy if we're taking those seven kings to represent seven presidents of this second beast of Revelation 12 or 13, pardon me, the two horn beast. Right. So. So this becomes much more direct, saying that there are seven kings and then that the eighth is going to be the papal beast of Revelation 13. So the papacy comes in as this eighth, as a counterfeit. So this is this is taking these, these seven kings of Judah, the seven kings of Persia, the first seven kings of Rome, setting them up as a parallel. And, and of course, the beast there is just only in relation to uh, the seven kings of Judah, which we could put under here as well. But so the beast now is, is a resurrection uh, because the image of the beast is being formed by the United States. So it becomes a much different idea in how we understand this eighth. It can't be an eighth president. It's the papacy. The papacy is not a president of the United States. They create even a more, more difficulty than we do by trying to make um, the eighth to be Trump when it's clear that the eighth is the papacy. Now, of course, they could do it as a parallel in some way, but it, this makes much more sense to me, what we have here. We just don't know who the next president is, whether it's a Republican or a Democrat or, or what it is. But it's we have a seventh president who's a Civil War president. And, and that dissolution of the United States you know, sets up the Sunday law. So that Civil War president may bring in a Sunday law as part of the plan to get the country back in shape. I don't know. But ultimately, we're going to have the beast. And the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet then all come together at the end. Brother Theodore? Yeah? Can I put forth a theory? It's just a theory. Okay. I, <clears throat> but... You do know when if Biden if Biden declares um, war and that he that he himself will stay in office until that war is over with, right? No. Yeah, that's that's what happens when you're in war. Not not in the United States. Why is it not? Why would it? Yeah, I think that's what they call the continuity of government. 
I think there is a law about that. No. Okay. No. Uh, okay, let's let's look at this in a different way. If the United States let's say the United States goes to war. And war technically cannot be declared by the president. You're aware of that, right? Right. Right. War has to be declared by Congress, the House yeah. and the Senate, right? Yeah, yeah. because yeah. it's a money, it's a money, money's involved as well, and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, the president just can't declare war. Okay. We have those that would wish to believe that a president can totally suspend an election and remain in power. Did that happen with Lincoln during the Civil War? No, it didn't. Okay. Did that happen with Franklin Delano Roosevelt during World War II? I don't think so, no. Mm -mm. Okay. Now, the elections went forward. Lincoln was very, very direct. He is famously quoted with, you don't change horses in the middle of a stream. Now, when Lincoln ran for re-election in 1864, who was his running mate? Was it Grant? No. No, oh, it wasn't Grant. I'm sorry. Grant was his general. Okay. What he chose in 1864. Now, what many people don't observe, Lincoln did not run as a Republican in 1864. Are you aware of that? No, I'm not. He ran under what was called the National Union Party. His running mate in 1864 was not his running mate in 1860, which was Schuyler, or Schuyler Colfax. His running mate in 1864 was Andrew Johnson, a Democrat. It was the only time in American history where members of two major parties were united on one ticket. Because Lincoln wanted to bring the country together. Johnson was a senator from the state of Tennessee, which had seceded from the Union. Now, in regarding mm -hmm. continuity of government, in order for a, an election to be suspended, you would have to suspend the Constitution. Okay. Well, I, I stand corrected. I just thought, you know, it was the idea. I didn't... Right. And and in, in this case, brother, the point that I'm I'm trying to make, we are looking so much for this, the, the coming Sunday law. We know it's going to be there. Right? right? But don't we also recognize that the Constitution will be abrogated? The Constitution will be set aside? Right. So in, this, in these situations... When we're looking at, at what's what's going to happen, we need to be looking at the steps that are leading us to this point. Mm -hmm. So here we have Biden. 
we've had as a as a situation for many to be aware of since the 25th amendment went into the constitution regarding the secession of power we have now had three times where a party became the acting president because the president of the United States had become disabled. The first time this happened, George Bush the first had to become acting president because Ronald Reagan had colon cancer surgery. And that occurred on the 13th of July of 1985. Dick Cheney became acting president twice. The first time on June 29th of 2002 and the second time on the 21st of July of 2007 when George Bush II had a colonoscopy. The most recent was on November 19th of 2021, when Kamala Harris became acting president, when Biden had a colonoscopy. Now, had something happened to any of these men while they were under anesthesia, these others would have become president. But it didn't happen that way. So the situation we have right now, what if something further happens to Biden? We then have Harris as the president of the United States. For me, that's a very scary thought. You don't know what. So historically, Yes, I can agree with this list where Trump is lined with Xerxes because we can see that we have three kings coming since Cyrus and then the fourth, Xerxes, being richer than they all, matches well with Trump. Having Artabanus as Biden works under the current constitutional form. Going to a Civil War president as the seventh makes logical sense. And then seeing that segue into the beast as the eighth, I think is is the best explanation that we're going to be able to have at this time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, um, you know, so with, you know, with Collins line, you know, I have trouble starting with Reagan as one just because of how we've paralleled these. Right. Um, so that's not really taking the model that that we have with the kings of Persia. Or the kings of Judah. Um, now. I mean, obviously, there's lots of speculation about what's going to happen. And people look, people keep looking for the Sunday law. But the Sunday law is not really the next step. Right? You're just not going to have a president come in and just declare a Sunday law. No, you're not. Right? So, you know, the question is what precipitates that? We see that there is going to be a civil war. Ellen White says that there is going to be. We see that working in what's happening in the United States. But people are, are just getting crazy in how they're looking at things. Nobody cares about what the truth is anymore. And um, we have no trust in the media. Um, the country is really preparing for civil war. Um, so, you know, however we're going to look at this, 
all we can see is that whatever is happening next, no matter which way it goes, whether it ends up being Trump or not, that the United States is heading to to a civil war, and, and that would make the most sense. But we don't know. We don't know if this model is correct. This is just a suggestion. I think this model has more validity than many of the others. Yeah, I would say so. And and definitely we can see now the explanation of Revelation 17. But the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, means that it can't be a president. Right. And and he does he's not one of the seven. He comes from the seven, that is, the seven presidents of the United States who are involved in the dissolution of republicanism and Protestantism in our line. They're going to cause the image to the beast. And 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 as many as, you know, to worship to worship the bini, image and uh, the beast and his image, right? And and that would mark the eighth. So so it doesn't it doesn't really say that. You know, the eighth is necessarily a king as such, even in that context. But just that he, the eight is a symbol of a counterfeit of Christ. It's the symbol of the resurrection. So all this fits together much more completely than any other interpretation that I've seen of Revelation 12, 13, and 17. But where this also fits just as as we had been addressing before about the horns when when we're dealing with the little horn does the little horn come up out of greece well it it comes out of one of the winds it comes out of one of the winds but does it come up out of greece well no right no. So this this is why this parallel helps mm -hmm. us is helped to be supported by looking at how the little horn comes up as well. Yes. Yeah. No, I, it's just very consistent with everything that we've looked at. In, yeah. The only question is whether it's actually going to happen this way. But um, to me, it seems the most reasonable. Now, we know that Jeff is writing to some degree about what's happening with American politics. Right. And I haven't read enough to see <clears throat> how he's looking at Trump completely. I just, you know, skimmed through some of the articles when they come up. I think. But, what? Okay, go on. I think the best recommendation that we could have at the moment is if we've been following those articles, go over articles number 9, 10, and 11 of what he's presented on Elijah. Okay. It's yeah, not I, haven't, I haven't looked at number 11 yet. Okay. But generally, what is he saying about Trump? That's what I... Um, if I read, if I went through number ten correctly, if I understood it correctly, then mm -hmm. he would be looking at Trump succeeding Biden. Okay, so and that's kind of what I gathered from what I looked at. Now, so for people like Colin, he's saying, "Well, Jeff is agreeing with me, right?" Right. So the American group and Canadian groups are supporting Jeff coming back and writing these articles that we need to listen to what he's saying. The only problem is Jeff has rejected July 18 and would re reject all of Colin's arguments for what Colin is doing in placing Trump in the way that he has, because Jeff is using a different method to get Trump back. Right. Right. Okay. So Jeff has rejected all of the different arguments that we've used before, and he's just starting from, you know, going back to the drawing board and then just saying, looking at present events, 
and then just making predictions with taking different stories and applying them however he wants to apply them, which is very unlike Jeff. Right. Agreed. Brother, uh, do you, uh, in Dwight, do you, did you see the diagram that Collins put out? On a, on a July 18th? I did not. <clears throat> we had July 18th with April 19th. And I said it was, you know, it was the first disappointment. I had, I had not seen basically anything that Collins put out for the last several weeks. Well, he got he, eight July 18th, he's supposed to go on to, um, 1844, it's supposed to be uh, the second disappointment. Yeah, so what, what Colin's doing is just he's ignoring November 9th as the first disappointment, making July 18th the first disappointment. Right. right. And he, he also made January the 20th a uh, second disappointment of 2021. So, so wouldn't that be like um, moving away marks? Well, yeah, it's not just it's not just moving the way marks. I mean, it's actually completely ignoring the lines and on what's happened in the past. But but this is what's to be expected when we look at the repeat of Millerite history. That we just see. Um, the same. The same thing that we happened after happened after October twenty second, eighteen forty four. People making predictions and um, not following through. Well, you can expect me to get um, get um, already punished over this, but I'm just saying that he when he puts eight July eighteenth. It's the first disappointment under July, I mean, April 19th. Yeah. To me, to me, he's already denying July 18th. Wouldn't you say that? Because he, he's putting it in, a, he's putting it under the July, I mean, April 19th. Yeah. I, I, it doesn't make any sense. So here's what you're talking about. Yeah, right there. <clears throat> Yeah. So he put it under, he put it under the first disappointment, and caused it a midnight cry, right? So, yeah. Now there's a reason he's. I just don't yeah. understand. Yeah. So yeah, there's a reason he's doing that. So he's looking at the 186 days, um, from July 18th to January 20th. Now. Um, is that 186 days? I don't think so. Okay, that is. Oh, right, that is. So 186 days from July 18th to January 20th, 2021. Okay. So that's gonna be like um, April 19th and October 22nd. So he's taking those two there. What's the problem with this though, is putting July 18th as the first disappointment? <clears throat> Because November 9th, it's going to parallel um, April 19th, right? It's going to be the first disappointment. So it is possible on some kind of line that we could do this, right? Because you got the 1,533 days. Yes, I remember this now. Um, Right. So you got 1,533 days from November 9th, 2016 to January 20th, 2021. Now, would Jeff do this? 
I don't know what Jeff would do. Well, he wouldn't accept this, right? Because if he accepts this, then he can't make the statement that all of the stuff that led to July 18th was nonsense, right? Because if you accept this, you have to accept all the arguments that led to July 18th in the first place. And Jeff is saying, you know, we made a mistake in all of that. Not just about the event, but actually as to the time. That, what, what that would be like is saying that the Millerites made a mistake with the first disappointment of it, of April 19th of 1844. Yeah. Now, so I think that there is a validity in, in this chronology, right? But what we can't do is say that this is the line, that we're now going to say that this is the first disappointment, this is the second. We need more than that. Um, so, you know, we should look at this at some time again, because we have other lines where we have, um, you know, January 6, 2021 and 187 days. Right. That's going to be from the 100 days of prayer. Using using this. Yeah. How many days would we have from. July 18th of 2020 to December 6th of 2020? Um, I, I can't remember what it is. It's not a significant number that I know. Okay. I can't remember what it was. It was like 100 and, around 150 days, but, you know, more or less. Um, I think it was last thing, but I don't remember the number. But anyway, the point is, there, there's validity in what he's showing here. But this wouldn't be accepted by Jeff. Because if Jeff accepted this, then he has to go back on everything that he said about how we have done this in the first place. But also, even if you have this as the second disappointment, if you're going to try to parallel this with Millerite history, then, then you do have a problem as far as, um, you know, taking Jeff back. Because we can't take back William Miller after October 22, 1844, as the leader of the movement. So, so people can use things that are correct, but if they're not put in a proper context, um, they're not going to make sense. They're going to they're going to draw wrong conclusions. Anyway, we went a little bit over, but um, I appreciate uh, uh, the discussions today, and we're going to address some of these things in in future studies. But before, so any any comments before we close with prayer? Not for me. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study today. And we ask for your continued presence as we look into these things, as we try to understand them. And um, we know, Lord, that there's much that we do not understand. And there's many places in which we are wrong in our understanding that we need to be corrected. Uh, so we just ask for your spirit to continue to work in our lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name.